Hello, welcome to Bethany Church. I'm Pastor Joe. We're going through the timeless principles, and if there's one principle that probably we've all heard of, it's to love one another. One thing I discovered, and one thing I'm learning this week, we're one another is a word we don't have in our language, and the word for love, at least the one that Jesus used, is one we don't have as well. That specific word shows a gap in our understanding and a gap in our application of why and what this one another is. This week we'll be looking at John 13, 34 and discovering what loving one another really is for the authentic Christian, for the person that really wants to live it out. Before we look at that, we invite you to check out our website, bethanyscofield.org, discover more about how we have real life, real faith, and real people at Bethany Church. Whether for our youngest children to our oldest, we have something for you, striving and helping and hoping we can bring faith alive in our people. For me, for you, for all of us, we we make a point to say we don't do it perfectly but we do it together. If you'd like to know more about Bethany, or if you have questions particular to your situation and growing in your faith or what it means to live that out, please reach out to us at Bethany and we'll do whatever we can. Whether you're a young person, middle-aged with parents, with children, whatever your situation, we love to help people grow in their faith. With that said, let's look into God's word. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for your word that gives insight into what it means to love you. I pray that we would be people that would seek to honor you, living by the book and loving our world just like you would have us. I praise you and thank you that this is the day that you have made. I pray that we can live out our faith in a way that brings honor to you. In John chapter 13, it's it plays almost like a movie. It plays out like a, a story. The, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke are synoptic. They, they follow more of a timeline. They, they're, uh, and, and they're quite similar to each other. The, the same stories, the same words, everything. John's different. In, in the Gospel of John, we see themes coming out. And, and John tries to paint a picture. It's... It's, it's, it's incredible writing to help bring us into what was being said and what was being done. And in John chapter 13, there's a story that sets the tone for, the, for what would be a third of his book. In, in the Gospel of John, a full third of his story is devoted to the last few hours of Jesus' life here on earth. It, 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 the, before the cross, that is. It... it just takes time for his, uh, what happened, the stories, the, everything that was going on. And John does a magnificent job of pulling us in, not to just what was happening, but to why. He's pulling us into the inner circle of what it meant to be one of Jesus' disciples. And if you were to be one of these disciples in that room, in that moment, if you read the Gospel of John, you can understand better what Jesus had in mind for all of his disciples. In John chapter 13, they're in the upper room. And in this upper room, he's sitting down to dinner with them. And the striking example that he gives them is actually of a foot washing. You have to remember, back in those days, it was the dusty, dirty roads of Jerusalem. And everybody wore sandals. And they were sitting down to an elaborate Passover meal, the, one of the finest and fanciest meals. And yet the waft from their feet must have been horrible. It was not strange at all that they would have sandy, sandaled feet that were that were dirty. And it wouldn't have been strange that there wouldn't have been there would have been some way or somewhere for someone to wash those feet. What was striking in this story is that Jesus was the one that would wash them for it. In Mark chapter 13, we're told it's the beginning of the fast, 
Passover festival. And Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. But he wanted to show them just how it was going to happen. And this foot washing was what would set the tone. In heaven, he had created the universe. He'd made the Grand Canyon. He'd made Everest, Mount Everest. He made artists and engineers. He created every little baby and their perfect little fingers and toes. He he put together math, music, and doctors. Then he arrives on the earth and he was doing teaching and he was doing healing. And now in this upper room, this last moment with his disciples, when he could have taught about anything, he could have said anything, he could have... Uh, anything was at his fingertips of what he could have done. He could have done miracles, he could have done so many things. Called down angels, called down armies. Of all the things that he could have done in that moment, with all the power in the universe at his disposal, instead he showed the way he wanted his disciples to live. Imagine that for a moment. We live in a world that is all about power and control and getting our way. And at a moment when we most want to have things go the direction we think they should, Jesus shows us a completely different way of reaching the world. As we will see, his goal in all of this was never to get his way, but to change the heart of people to desire his way. To help them see things from a new perspective and to choose to obey and love him like he did to us. Believe it or not, the, the, the God of the universe that created Jupiter started and he gave his one of his most powerful teachings. And he started off with the illustration of washing feet. So now a new command I'm giving you, love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. What does love look like to you? Try to write it, give a definition, Maybe draw a picture. Would you maybe show someone a movie or tell a story? In one kind, concise chapter, John shows us what it is. He's telling us the story of Jesus. And, and, and while there's sequential ways and orderly ways to do it, John is telling the stories, trying to help us grasp this concept. And John 13 is the start of this powerful version of what John wants us to know. Our world struggles to understand what this very concept, this concept of love is. If you watch a Hollywood movie, you think it's about romantic, ushy gushy love, and, and that's the picture many of us probably have in our mind. This, it's almost like a sickness kind of love. It makes people do things they never would have thought. They spend time with people that you can't even imagine. And you've probably seen those couples out there. That's what it was. The only cure for this sickness and the hour long talks that these people can have with each other is time. And if Hollywood is left to its own devices, almost all of those relationships fail. There's other kinds of love many of us are familiar with. There's family love. And this is usually based more on loyalty than kindness. It's because we're blood, we have to stick together. And it is that word have to that makes it stick. Kindness is optional for some of these kinds of love. What Jesus is talking about in here is agape love. It encompasses some of the finest, best parts of the romantic love, some of the best parts of family love, and takes out all the rubbish and gives us himself. That's what he wants for us. There's three all life-altering characteristics of Jesus' love. And for the authentic Christian, they're going to have them as well. The first characteristic Authentic love is unconditional in expression. Authentic love is 
unconditional in expression. If you think about it, Jesus did this. He expressed his love to whoever was in his world. He was noted for loving the undesirable. Think of the people that Jesus associated with in the Gospels. Zacchaeus, who affiliated with the Romans. A Samaritan woman with multiple husbands, who was ostracized in her own town. A woman caught in adultery, and yet he was also associated with Nicodemus, a members of the Pharisees. Fishermen that worked hard for their living. Zealots that stood up to the Roman government. No one who desired with him, uh, desired a relationship with him was left out. If you remember, he wept over Jerusalem, the people that would reject who he was and didn't come to him. Authentic love is unconditional in expression. It's towards every single one. John 13, 1 through 5 says this. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come from believe this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began washing his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had wrapped around them. Foot washing was not strange, but the man doing it, was. He set the tone for what love is by him doing it, not commanding someone to do it or making sure that they're clean, but expressing love by doing it himself. A comparison I've heard was it would be like Queen Elizabeth coming to your house and the first thing you do is handing her a broom to clean up the kitchen. I'm sure Queen Elizabeth has swept a floor before and she would certainly understand what it is. But it would be jarring to see her do it, especially as a guest. Yet Jesus demonstrates to his disciples, this is the kind of love that I want. Uh, uh, a sacrificial giving up. And to anyone that was nearby that would receive it. Unconditional expression. He loved every person in the room. Washing every feet. Judas was in that room. The man that would betray him. And he knew it. Peter would be in the room and he would deny him. And Jesus knew that as well. These are the men that Jesus washed their feet of. Not the ones that had it together, but the ones that God put near him. Who are the ones that God has put into your world and in your proximity? Certainly there are people that rub you raw. You hear even the, their voice. You hear their message. You hear what they're about. And it rubs you raw. Yet these are the very people God called us to love. It's unconditional. It doesn't wait for someone to figure out who Christ is or what they're about or to get all their things in a row. Instead, this love is expressed to those to them first without them getting a chance to express it back. Authentic love. Secondly, the second application of this love, of the life-altering characteristics of this love, is its unselfish in motive. Authentic Christians expect nothing in return for, the, for their kindness and without regard for their self-interest. And yet this kind of love is dangerous. It can be taken advantage of and it puts us at risk. Think about those you love in your life. Can you think about when that started? How it happened? There's almost always they gave and you gave. And there was a mutual attraction, a mutual giving that allowed it to come to life. That's not what agape love is based on, though. This love is unselfish. Not what it gets in return, but instead how it can be expressed. This is a different level of love. In fact, I would say it's... it's almost easy to express love to those you know you'll get it back from. Agape love is not based on what you might get. It, it, it can remove the reward from that person that you might get from them. It says it's just all about 
putting towards them what they would desire, what they would want. It's even expressing the love to them in a way that they can receive it and hear it best. John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Jesus came into human form. He didn't expect us to come to him. He went to us. He gave healing and teachings in ways that people could understand it not waiting for them to come and understand him. He walked along the dusty roads of Samaria, Galilee, and Judea, and went to where those people were, not waiting for them to come to him. He went to the synagogues, and then he left, and he spoke to people in them and out of them. That's where he went, with no expectation in return. This, there's a story I came upon this week. It's about a man named Henry Nowen. Some of you may have heard of him. He was, a, he was a teacher, a professor, and he was lost. He had faith. He was a person that had a rich, rich, deep faith in God. And um, he was called upon to teach at some of the most prestigious schools in the world. He was a professor at Yale, at Duke, and at... Harvard, and it was at Harvard that one of his colleagues just saw the lostness in him. So later in his life, in his 50s, for some of the last years of his life, he started serving at a community called Lark. Le Arc. Le Arc is um, the Ark. It's a home or community for the mentally disabled. It was in this time that all the theories and practices of Henry Newman's life came to life because it was no longer based on what they could give to him, but instead what he could give back to them. And he discovered it actually taught him some things he never knew about God's love. Henry Nouwen's writings about the Christian life, about discipleship, about growing, are well loved because he shared so freely about his failings and his his faults and people could relate to him but it wasn't until he went to the ark later in his life and he met a man named Adam Adam Arnett a core member of one of these communities and he had profound de de developmental disabilities Henry wrote it is I not Adam who gets the main benefit from our friendship now and insisted. He wrote about this relationship in a book entitled Adam, God's Beloved. There is something we learn from loving those that cannot give us anything in return back that we cannot learn in any other way. Authentic love is unselfish in motive. Who is a person that you could love that could not express it back? That is when we will discover what real love and we understand it to ourselves. Finally, authentic love and a characteristic of Jesus' authentic love is it is unlimited in its benefits. It's unlimited in its benefits. Agape love is its own reward. By pouring it out, by giving it out to the undesirable and those that can't return. So there's these undesirable people that are being loved on and they can't give it back that we love it. There's something that comes back to the giver in, in no other way that could be understood. And it works every single time. The, the satisfaction is incredible. And while agape is obedience and we do this, Jesus understood the satisfaction that God's love was on him. There's something we experience in our soul when we express that love to a world that no other thing on earth can show us. It's unlimited in its benefits. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8, that says, The man who plants and the one who waters have one person, each will be rewarded according to his own labor. There is some reward for this that cannot be found in any other way. Jesus is giving this command as a way for us to understand something about ourselves and who he is that we cannot understand any other way. Listen to the depth of this. In John, 1 John 3.16, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John, the letter of John, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. 
He's looking for our way to do that. It's giving is its own reward. The giving is what God infuses back into us. There's something that Jesus did on the cross, an expression of love that we can experience back for ourselves. I think little children might know this best. There's a little child that's just started coming to Bethany, and it's, I, I've never seen this, at least it's never happened to me before. This little child will come up to me. There's, this child doesn't know words yet. It's, they're so young, they can't know words yet. And they'll just come up, and even though I don't know this child, they give me a hug every Sunday, and it's, it's amazing. I don't know how to explain it except that that child gets its own reward from that. They, they, there's something that child knows about expressing and showing, I guess it's love. It, it must be that it just knows. I would love for each of us to have something of that inside of us where just the expression of love, and we know that we did the right thing today because we express love out into our world in a world that's so hurting and lost. I'm sure you've seen it. In a world, there's people that are on purpose hurting one another. There's shouting it down. We, we look for the worst in one another. We expect more of that. But agape love looks for the best and expresses care and concern and without thinking of the risk to themselves, just it gives, it, gives it out. This is the kind of love that Jesus expressed to his disciples and he commands for us. We discover authentic love by giving it away and Jesus is our example. Jesus didn't wait for his disciples to figure out. He just delivered love and looked for God to use it for his glory. Have you discovered this yet? Have you given away your love? It's possible. Authentic love cannot exist apart from action. Authentic love cannot exist apart from action. Love towards one another is not new. If you read Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, we're told to love your neighbor as yourself. So this is not really a new command. But it is new in this. The degree and the direction by which God showed us. Not waiting for people to love us back, but to seek to love them first. Jesus modeled it, and we are to do it like he showed us. In John 14, 31, it says this, The world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Disciples are to reflect the sort of love that Jesus knew. A love expressed through obedience. As I loved you, it points to his foot washing. Getting our hands dirty on our hands and knees without thought to the status that it shows. And truly love one another through a life of service and sacrifice. God measures love in part by obedience, not by the warm, fuzzy feelings. In John's letters, the believers he told them they could know they love one another by their obedience to God's commands. Love and obedience are so closely connected that John says this is love for God to obey his commands. The John of the Apostle had seen it all. He had seen the miracles. He had heard the teachings. And yet when it came right down to it, he wanted his disciples, to, he wanted them to understand what he knew. And that's this love and the expression of love towards one, especially those that could never love us back. The undesirables of our world that think the wrong way. It's that kind of love towards them without thought of the risk and loss. That is when we begin to understand the true love that we have from God. John's storyline is of authentic Christians. The love that people have with fits and starts and gaps and holes. But ultimately, it lands in a person's heart and they understand that this is something they need more than anything else. More than success, more than position, more than prestige. Along the way, we come into disappointment with one another, hurt, and things go wrong. 
is if John is reminding us our goal long is to love one another, not for the response we get, but because God desires it. I can just imagine Jesus at times must have wondered, why am I doing this? This group of disciples doesn't get it. And then he reminded himself, I wasn't doing, I, I'm doing it for them, but I'm, I'm doing it for my love for the Father as well. In fact, that's the overarching thing. My love for the Father is what allows me to love, even if they don't understand it. Perhaps that's how we feel about the Castorons. We, we wonder why, why should I bother? But instead take time to consider Jesus and obedience to God's will and being right with him, knowing we are right with him brings a satisfaction that nothing on the earth can touch. Some next steps for you to consider this week. How will you love the unlovable? You have unlovable in your world. They might be your neighbor. They might live with you. How will you love them this week? Second, what would Jesus' sacrificial love look like towards the unlovely? You might have to think about things like their love language. How would they receive love in a way that they will tangibly understand it? Not giving it in the way you understand it, but the way that they would. And finally, what tangible step of agape love will extend this week? Think of a plan and let's put it into action. God's love is alive when it's shown through obedience. That is how we do it. So now I'm giving you a new command. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, loved you, you should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples.